I'm supposed to be studying the little green stuff down here, but over my career I've um, kind of gone from studying ecology in places like central Massachusetts, Harvard Forest, to studying ecology in cities, um, Boston, and then studying ecology of cities, so the coupled human natural systems. Um, and as a result of that work, I kind of stumbled into the issue of natural gas running on our streets and sidewalks um, because they kill trees. And I was, my story is I was walking down the street two blocks away from our home in Newton with my son, and we came across a person who had this Ghostbusters looking little snipper um, and was looking at how gas leaks were damaging trees. So that's what hooked me, because I wanted to know why the trees are being killed by the gas. Um, but then it quickly became apparent that it's a greenhouse gas, a very powerful greenhouse gas, the methane in the natural gas. Um, it has air quality issues. It leads to explosions. So um, since about 2010, uh, it's been a very amazing um, kind of broadening of the, the research that, that I've been doing. So I want to share with you um, the three research findings, three papers that I was involved in, in doing on the issue of natural gas leaks, and then three sets of solutions that we're, we're working on. Um, I'm going to use a lot of mixed metaphors. I haven't figured out how to like put these all together, but I'm going to talk about cooking the planet in a way that maybe we haven't really thought about. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, off-ramps from the bridge of natural uh, gas and, you know, whether we're going to be on autopilot or using a blinker to, to, to come off of that bridge. And I'm going to be talking about trees, but in a different kind of way, pruning trees, pruning the gas grid, thinking about the gas grid as a tree itself. Um, so somehow, hopefully, this will make sense. And um, so just to start off, here is the state house, and these are leaks um, of natural gas. The uh, background level, ambient level of methane uh, should be under two parts per million. So these are um, leaks just in kind of the neighborhood here of the state house that are multiple times um, what should be the background methane value. So these are pipe, leaks coming out of the pipes that are running under our streets and sidewalks. And that ambient value itself has changed over um, as a result of the Industrial Revolution. So um, even 150 years ago um, or, or less, the methane was about uh, 0.75 parts per million. And this is what's happened as a result of much of our human activity um, in the last uh, decades. Um, and, and on this time scale of 10,000 years ago, it, you can really see that um, we've, we've really changed methane. In fact, proportionally, it's grown faster uh, than CO2 has. Uh, and this continues even just into the most recent years, even into the last month, you can see this increase on the global level. And this is an, um, a greenhouse gas that's um, dozens of times more powerful than CO2 uh, on a mass per mass basis. So it's a very powerful greenhouse gas. And what we know is that even conservative estimates of how much is leaking out across the process chain of the fossil fuel industry is the largest single producer of methane in the United States. So these are EPA estimates that show from natural gas and petroleum sy systems as well as coal mining. If you put those two together, um, that's a bigger chunk um, than any other piece of methane emissions. So uh, just a quick outline. Uh, I'm going to talk about the scope of the urban gas leaks, um, the impact uh, greenhouse gas-wise, and, the, and uh, three sets of solutions to that. Okay, so let's start off here. And in as a result of, of this chance meeting in 2010, and learning about this issue, we got some funding from the Barr Foundation, which is a Boston-based nonprofit organization, foundation, to do a study that basically went to all of the streets of Boston within the city limits and just counted up how many of these natural gas leaks are there. Uh, and what we know, so we counted over 3,000 leaks in the city limits of, of Boston. 
Um, and what we know is that this problem is not just a Boston problem. Uh, we know that it's in greater Boston, Worcester, across the Commonwealth, um, and also across the eastern seaboard. So we've subsequently done work in D.C. to map the pipeline leaks there and found over 6,000 leaks in Washington, D.C. If anything, that city is a little bit worse than Boston. Baltimore is bad. Providence, Rhode Island is bad. Uh, many of the cities along the eastern seaboard are, are bad. Uh, Manhattan and New York City has a lot of leaks as well. Um, and, you know, in, in Manhattan, um, I can't even remember how many hundreds of, of leaks or maybe over a thousand leaks that we got in that city. And Con Edison is reporting 40 leaks. So there are huge discrepancies in the, you know, the what's reported in terms of uh, how widespread the problem is. So this is a picture of, of Boston, and these are the 3,356 leaks. So, so there's a level of quantification spatially here, and as well, you know, the values. So there's some level of quantification, but the question we were always asked was, what's it amount to? How much do all of these leaks amount to? And that is such a difficult question to answer. Um, because one way you could do that is go back to all of these leaks. We just drove by these leaks with a GPS-enabled sniffer in a car. So that's very easy to do. But to actually go back and find out how much is coming out of these leaks is a very laborious process. Uh, that's one way you could do that. It would take, uh, we would still be out there today trying to quantify if, if we were going to do that. Um, I'll, I'll come back to how we did address that in a second study. But I just want to make the point that it's no secret why this is the case. Uh, it's old infrastructure, not just in Boston, but across the eastern seaboard. So here's a picture of the Back Bay in downtown Boston. Um, here's 8-inch cast iron, that's the old leaky stuff, low pressure 1860 pipe running down Beacon Street. This one on uh, Commonwealth Avenue uh, around the mall, 10-inch cast iron, low pressure, 1882. Okay, so there's very, very old cast iron pipes, um, and, and that's what the uh, cause of the, the leaks are. Um, they fail both from corrosion, they fail at the joints. These pipes come in 12-foot sections, and so where they're joined, um, the sealant has, um, you know, aged and cracks form and leaks come out uh, there. Um, this is a, uh, a little bit of a blurry version of, of a pipe that was punctured by a gas worker looking for a gas leak. Um, and it just indicates that, the, to me, it exemplifies how this is a hidden problem. Even the experts don't, even the professionals don't quite know where everything is. This pipe was responsible for an explosion that had occurred in Springfield, Massachusetts in 2013, in November 2013, that um, injured 19 people. Fortunately, no one was killed and wiped out, um, basically destroyed a number of buildings. Now here's, uh, I, I was mentioning I, I'm very good at putting an audience to sleep, but um, so th there's a lot here, but I want you to just indicate something from this um, table that is reported to the Energy Information Administration, and it's what's called lost and unaccounted for gas, okay? And the leaking methane is part of that, but it's not everything. I call it a um, kind of a known unknown, or maybe somewhat of an unknown unknown, um, to paraphrase um, whoever that person is, Donald Rumsfeld, yes. Um, so we started looking into, well, maybe some, doesn't someone know how much is leaking? You know, isn't something already reported? And yes, things are reported. Um, but if you look at this across all 50 states, this table keeps going. Um, the numbers for lost and unaccounted for gas, which, which are some combination of leaks, accounting errors, and meter errors, because there's about 700,000 downstream meters in our homes in a building like this um, that all have to be added up and supposedly should equal the few big trunk line meters at the, what are called the city gates where the gas is being delivered into the Commonwealth. When those numbers don't add up, that's lost and unaccounted for gas. But it is a huge black box, and I'm just going to point out something. Okay, these numbers don't make any sense to you because they don't even have units on them. But this is 5.4 billion cubic feet 
of natural gas in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that was unaccounted for in 2005. Um, in 2009, we had 12.9 billion cubic feet of natural gas that was unaccounted for, lost and unaccounted for. Um, this ends up being about maybe 3.5% of the total amount of delivered natural gas. This is maybe a percent and a half. So if you start looking at all these numbers, a couple things pop out or, or don't pop up. It's a complete scattershot. There's no rhyme or reason to any of this. It's, it's random. Numbers go from negative values. You see there's some negative values. Next year, positive value. Here's another negative value, positive value. Um, the magnitudes of, in different states are huge. Um, the swings are very large. Um, a negative value of loss in the unaccounted for gas would indicate that more actually uh, came out of the system than was put into the system to start with. So that's how unbounded our knowledge is of what's happening to the gas. And the stakes are extremely high because the degree to which it's leaked at you know up to 86 times the greenhouse warming potential methane versus CO2, um, a, a, um, a leak rate of 3% is about 10% of the Commonwealth's entire greenhouse gas emissions inventory from all sectors, okay? So we need to, to try to get some information on this. Um, just in the last year, because that previous ta table was a little bit dated, 2016, Massachusetts cannot account for about 3.3% of the amount of gas that, that was delivered. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip that. Uh, it comes down to understanding and constraining um, leak rates as well as these 700,000 downstream meters. This is the meter in my own home in the basement of our house, and it spins. Uh, as we use gas, we're on gas in my house to heat the hot water, and we need to start constraining the errors on all of these meters. So that's one of the future research areas that we're starting to get, um, you know, interested in doing. Um, the the data sheet. We start looking at data sheets from these these uh, units. Um, this is actually a pretty un new unit. Um, we're on National Grid Gas 2016. This was put in, um, but the technology is not really very advanced. This is the same stuff that they've been using for, you know, um, over a decade in terms of metering gas. At a time in which gas was really thought of as a commodity, and a few percent, if you lose it, it's just not that big of a deal. No one was really thinking about how powerful this was as a greenhouse gas when the current kind of technology of meters were put into all of our homes. And, you know, it, you look at... Uh, uh, meter accuracy as as put on the uh, spec sheets for these meters, and it looks pretty good. I mean, zero, here's zero, and depending on different conditions of flow rate of gas through them, um, it looks like it's really, really pretty good. And um, however, uh, and you really can't see this, but the fine print, individual meter performance may vary. This is what we really need to to check because what they do in a lab on, you know, a unit like this to check it under those conditions versus how these units are delivered by, by the pallet um, to installers and how they get installed and whether they're checked at installation is really completely unknown. So we need to constrain um, both the meter errors, we need to get better at the accounting, and we need to understand the leak rate itself um, better. So we did actually follow up and try to determine this, um, the impact of the problem that we looked at um, in our earlier study. And to do that, instead of going back to all of those thousands of leaks um, and doing the bottom-up study, we said, let's use a top-down approach. Let's use the integrating power of the atmosphere itself as kind of a, kind of a bathtub of, of, of fluid in which all of these leaks are essentially feeding into this, um, this urban uh, boundary layer of, of air. And so, we were able to get um, the agreement of uh, the Prudential building, and we installed our high-tech sniffer um, on the top of this building uh, in a little shed here, and we had inlets on the four corners of the Prudential building um, just because we wanted to make sure we always had upwind air um, because there's a lot of stuff coming out of the building itself that could give us 
you know, indications of, of methane that are, are not the, the air of Boston itself. Um, in addition to this location, we had um, a methane analyzer running in synchronicity with that one at the top of our fifth floor story fifth building at Boston University. Um, another one on the top of Harvard Forest, the tower on top of Harvard Forest where there's basically no ga uh, natural gas infrastructure. Um, another uh, in kind of a downwind of Boston at the very tip of the Nahant Peninsula at a private home. So we had this little network um, of places where we're measuring methane levels with high precision and uh, I'll tell you what we found next. So this was a study that um, we did in collaboration with people at Harvard University, Catherine McCain and Steve Wofsey and others, uh, Duke University, Robert, uh, Bob, uh, Robert Jackson, Rob Jackson. Um, and so here, here's the basic result. Um, this is the map of uh, Eastern Massachusetts um, and this is kind of the scope of the area that we studied. The bluish um, hue that you see there is um, where natural gas is being consumed. It's an indication of where the pipelines are for natural gas. So you can see Harvard Forest is outside of that, um, kind of isolated from those. Um, and here we get into the built up area where the natural gas infrastructure is. There's our little BU site, there's the Nahant site, and there's the Copley Plot, uh, Tower uh, Prudential Building site. Um, and so basically this is called an inversion model for the atmosphere where we know you could say we know the answer in a few four, four locations with pretty good precision. And so we invert, you know, we have the answer and we basically construct a atmos an atmospheric model um, that essentially becomes, is consistent with what we're reading in these locations. So you can think of a mass of air, like a, a slab of air as it moves um, with the predominant winds in this direction. And as it moves, it gets enriched with CO, uh, with methane from all of those leaks. So it should be pretty low here. And as the air mass moves over, it starts to get contributed, um, you know, the, the methane built up. Now you may be thinking, well, there's other sources of methane. It's not just pipeline gas, right? And that is absolutely the case. So we needed to be able to distinguish leaks from the pipelines versus leaks from wh where else um, might, might methane be coming from? Farms. Farms, cows, swamps, anything else? Landfills, yeah. So absolutely, th these are sources of methane. Those, those sources are what we call biogenic sources of methane. And the stuff that comes out of the, the shale, the deep, um, you know, a mile down stuff that's fracked is called thermogenic methane. And there's two things that distinguish thermogenic methane from biogenic methane. One is that there's thermogenic methane is heavier. It has more C13, the stable isotope of carbon, than C12, okay? And, and methane is CH4. It's one carbon surrounded, bonded to four hydrogens. So it carries with it a stable isotopic signature of thermogenic methane. So that's one thing that we, we check. The other thing that in natural gas that is not in biogenic sources are what we call mass balance tracers. There's other hydrocarbons. There's heavier hydrocarbons, in particular ethane. Um, uh, ethane is C2H6. It's like Legos. It's the next biggest chain of hydrocarbon. Methane is the simplest. CH4 and then the CH6 and then you go up to higher chain hydrocarbons from there. But in, in natural gas, it's typically somewhere from two to five percent ethane and maybe 90, 95 percent methane. Okay. And we know what the concentration is of ethane in the pipelines because it's tracked with great um, precision by the companies that are selling the gas on every hourly basis because it's actually called the gas quality. It says how much energy is in the gas. So they need to know, they, they need to know that because they're selling this commodity, this energy commodity, and the buyers want to know what the uh, heating value is of that gas. So knowing what's in the pipeline with ethane, we went up into the atmosphere and measured the methane and the ethane up in the atmosphere. If it carried the same fraction, two to five percent up in the air as what we're measuring in the pipe, that would mean that everything we measure is natural gas leaks. 
the degree to which it's diluted, that fraction is diluted into the atmosphere, is the degree to which biogenic sources are contributing to what we measure in the atmosphere, okay? So we used isotopes and we used this mass balance tracer, tracer of ethane. Um, and those two showed us here's, here's ethane and here's methane. Um, that the, the upshot is that a large portion of what we measured that was built up was due to pipeline leaks. The one-to-one -one line is uh, right here. You can't even see that there's a dash. You can barely see that there's a dashed line on top of this, this line here that, that is the pipeline ratio. Um, and in, in the atmosphere, in the fall and winter months at least, it's nearly one-to-one, -one, right on top of it. Okay? In spring months, there's a bit of a deviation of the pipeline uh, methane from what we measured in the atmosphere. Okay, so there's, a, there's more dilution happening here in the spring than in this period. But in either case, um, um, a lot, a big portion of the uh, buildup of methane in the atmosphere was due to pipeline leaks. And so we used this approach to estimate that about 2.7% of the delivered gas to the Commonwealth was leaked into the atmosphere, okay? And even using a conservative estimate of the global warming potential of methane, about 34 times that of CO2 over a century time scale, that amounted to about 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions inventory of the Commonwealth um, that had never been on the books. It hadn't been estimated before. Uh, so, um, so, so, you know, those numbers, that was for one year, Things change from year to year, so I don't like to say that is the number because it likely changes. 2.7%, um, we had put um, error, our own error estimates of plus or minus 0.6%, so there's a pretty big uh, range there. Um, the, I showed you that big boring table. Um, the lost gas estimated for 2016 by the utilities is about 1.6%. Okay, so there is some variation, um, and you know we we all need to do better to constrain these estimates. Um, but the 2.7 percent that we estimated for that year in the Commonwealth amounted to 90 million dollars in the value of the lost gas. Okay, uh, and and leak lost and unaccounted for gas is currently paid for by ratepayers. Okay, we pay for it, um, which is there's a bill right now that would shift the um, burden of that cost back to the utilities to incentivize them to fix them. Okay, so just um, three solutions um, to, the, to the problem, um, and, and I'll just give you them right now. Find and fix the biggest. Um, coordinate co-located and interdependent infrastructure on our streets and sidewalks. And then triage and tri transition off of this bridge fuel, okay? Um, so find and fix the biggest. Let's talk about that for a second. This is the third study um, that we did. So the first was to find out there was thousands of leaks in Boston. The second was to estimate how much was coming out. And then what um, Margaret Hendrick, a PhD student at BU, did was she wanted to ask the question, um, if we go back to the, on the ground to these leaks, um, is there anything that we can find out about how they're distributed it statistically in size that would give us, um, you know, a strategic ability to, um, you know, find problem leaks. Some are way worse than others. Or, or are leaks kind of like, you know, distributed like a bell-shaped curve where there's an average leak size. Some are a little higher, some are a little lower. Um, you know, characterizing their distribution. So she went back to 100 of the leaks that we had identified in our very first study. Um, on, that were on streets with this old cast iron uh, leaking pipe. And she, we, this is what we call fortuitous science methods where we used a turtle shell um, on a sandbox lid, which is really a wonderful um, size to go over um, these maintenance holes um, with the vents. Uh, we basically put little uh, padding and stuff so they'd seal to the, to the, to the, um, to the ground without losing gas. And there's our uh, sniffer that we're measuring the buildup of gas into this chamber of known volume over time. And as you, you can see, this ends up being a very laborious process. This is Margaret Hendrick um, and, and two other um, students working with her. 
Um, because the, the leaks, as you might imagine, they're coming out, you know, in very complex ways. They're it's, a, it's kind of the path, pathways of least resistance. They'll come through the soil, they'll come through cracks in the sidewalk, they'll come through uh, holes here, and it's a very laborious process. Um, and that's why we did that top-down study. We went to, to that approach. But to understand, um, you know, the nature of these leaks, we did this, she did this process of going back to 100 leaks and found um, that 7% of the 100 leaks that she looked at contributed 50% of the lost gas. So this, uh, there's a term that uh, has been used across the entire natural gas supply chain um, from fracking to other places downstream, which is called super emitters or long-tailed distributions, that it's not a bell-shaped curve, the leaks. A handful of leaks contribute the majority of the lost gas. And so I've never um, seen in my own work a, 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 a science result, a quantitative result that is so, that, that the policy implications are so direct from there because it basically says if you can find and fix those biggest leaks, uh, you will have a, a big impact on stemming, you know, outsized impact and a cost-effective impact on, on addressing the problem. Um, the second area of solutions for this problem is uh, what we call infrastructure ecology, okay, and coordination of infrastructure. And it was so eye-opening. Um, I'm going to go forward before I go back to that. Um, this, is, this happens all the time. Um, here's Newton Corner um, on my bikeway home. I pass by this. Uh, we fondly refer to this as the circle of death over the Mass Pike. Um, and uh, because of the traffic, it's crazy. Um, this was newly paved. You can see um, this line here, the shading line, new pavement from here all the way through here. Two weeks after the brand new paving goes down, um, a steel plate is put in, um, drill holes to find a leak. Um, here's the gas line, 10 inch cast iron. So they paved this brand new paving over leak prone cast iron pipe that we know is gonna leak or was already leaking. And as you know, this is essentially seeding a pothole. Um, and actually even, this is a few months ago now, it's like a depression um, in, in this area. So we saw multiple situations in which we have um, these co-located interdependent infrastructures that there's a gap, there's a lack of connecting the dots. Um, we saw trees, new sapling trees being planted into active gas leaks. That's a waste of about $1,000 for the tree crew, the value of the tree that's put in there. And it's just, you know, things aren't being communicated. And so what we, this really, you know, made us think is that, you know, our problems, we, we can have the concept of smart cities and people can be smart in their own particular um, piece. But if we're not kind of, um, we don't have a social ecology and a political ecology that is connected and communicating we can lead to a lot of bad outcomes like that. So our NSF um, coupled human natural uh, systems grant is basically, we call it infrastructure ecology, and it's to map um, the physical and biophysical infrastructure, including the green infrastructure, and then find the mapping between those co-located co multi-networks and the, the political social networks that are um, responsible or interested or have a stake in governing these and, and really finding the, the gaps um, and, and what are the barriers to, to developing connections that should actually be there. Um, this is uh, David McCauley Underground, um, and this is actually a street from Boston showing all of this, this stuff, um, indicating really that you know, this, a lot of the problem that we have with underground infrastructure is just we don't see it. Um, you know, it's out of sight, sight out of mind. Um, and you know, when we started mapping the gas leaks, it was just really interesting to me to meet people who knew about gas leaks, but they knew about the gas leak in their neighborhood on their route that they jogged on, for example. And you have hundreds of anecdotes, um, but you know you really need a map to, so everyone can see the scope of the problem. 
Um, and that, that's one of our challenges with the hidden uh, infrastructure. All right, so um, th those are you know, find, the, find and fix the biggest um, leaks is one, one area of solutions. Coordinated infrastructure is a second. And then third is, is um, I'm calling it the new big, big times five in terms of a price tag. And here um, is um, an opportunity for us to now think about um, our energy transition. Okay, so we have um, the city of Boston is committed to 100% energy, uh, renewable energy, no fossil fuels, net zero by 2050. The Commonwealth, the Global Warming Solutions Act, 80% reduction in fossil fuels by 2050. Okay. On the other hand, we have plans by the utilities to, to rebuild the natural gas infrastructure under our streets and sidewalks. Okay. Um, and it falls under this thing called the Gas and System Enhancement Program. Um, and we're facing a nine and a, as, as ratepayers in the Commonwealth, a nine and a half billion dollar um, committed ratepayer price tag to rebuild um, the pipeline uh, infrastructure over the next 20 years. Um, about a third of the pipelines in the Commonwealth are leak prone. So, you know, in, in terms of thinking about natural gas as a bridge fuel, um, we are facing right now a decision, and, and, and as ratepayers, as citizens, not just the regulators, not just the utilities, um, you know, when is the time to put the blinker on and start to move to the off ramp? Versus if we don't, if we just, if this happens, it's autopilot. Um, we're just going to go with the, we're going to rebuild the bridge the natural gas bridge. We're going to put new struts on the bridge. Um, so I think it's a, it's a really uh, um, important time for all of us to be thinking about this. Now, so interesting. Uh, so so uh, let's see. Let me go back for a second. We started thinking about this, and, and so I just, you know, the metaphor of driving and bridges and blinkers and autopilot. Um, but then there's also, I, I come back to the metaphor of trees and tree physiology. So, um, we, you know, I really, in the last two years, my thinking has completely flipped on how to address the problem of the leak, leaking gas pipelines. Two years ago, I was saying, you know, patching leaks is a band-aid solution. The real solution is to replace pipes. And now I've completely flipped my thinking on that, partly because of the study that Margaret Hendrick did, which shows that if you can find and fix the biggest leaks, you really can triage the system. So instead of rebuilding the system, triage the system, and instead of investing $9.5 billion over the next 20 years, uh, what if we reallocated that fund um, to those people who would want to use that fund to electrify our building sector instead, okay? And that's ultimately where we need to go, whether it's uh, in Boston by 2050, 100%, or the statewide, commonwealth-wide, 80% by 2050. Uh, the, the next really big thing is to electrify our building sector, okay? We're, you know, the work, you've heard a lot about EVs, charging stations, infrastructure for electrifying the transportation sector, but we really have to start talking and moving now to transitioning our, our building sector. And um, that's a challenge, uh, but it's also true that we're on the cusp of investing massive amounts of money not to do that. Infrastructure from the past. Um, and so, but what's been really fascinating to me as we've developed this plan and, and just right now are making an economic case. We don't have a business model. We're just saying there's a pot of nine and a half billion dollars. And that nine and a half billion dollars would, if it were reallocated, uh, electrify 20 to 40 percent of the homes in the entire Commonwealth. Okay. And that number is probably going to climb. Um, the big dig started off as two billion dollars and it ended up at 20 some billion dollars. So the initial price tag is, is nine and a half billion dollars today. What's that going to grow to in 20 years? Um, so it's a big chunk of money and, and I think we all need to be thinking about, about that. But 
Um, it's just so fascinating to me that this problem, this issue, this opportunity actually exemplifies the challenges we have as, as a society um, in terms of economics, our economic choices, our political choices and our political will, and also our human choices as to how we want to live and, the, and what we want to do in our houses. And it becomes a very personal um, type of situation. So, so cooking is such a, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the core of our humanity, cooking. And right now the narrative is that the best is gas. Cooking with gas is the best. So if you have an electric range, it's not as good as gas in terms of control and how fast it can heat things up. Um, you know, but you're not going to starve. You can still cook. But we, many of us make the choice that, you know, electric's not really good enough. Um, you know, I want the gas. Um, and these are the narratives and framing of the issue that is, is really very important for us to, to think about. Um, but the good thing is, um, as I've educated myself, um, gas is not the best for cooking, okay? Um, induction. How many people cook with induction? Okay. A couple. Okay, so induction is like a, a Tesla compared to a Ferrari, let's say. It outperforms um, it, because the heat is generated in the pan. It's a much more efficient, faster way to cook food. You can, it, you know, a quart of water boils faster on an induction cooktop than any gas stove. The efficiency is way greater. You're not generating heat inside, um, you know, a cooking area. You're not generating particulate matter and the other things that go along with combustion inside indoor environments. And so that's the other really interesting human thing that we've come across when we talk with folks. The first thing is like, well, I'm, I'm not going to give up my gas. And then we show them stuff like this, and they're like, oh. And then the second thing is my cookware. Um, and what most people don't realize, I didn't realize this either, is that uh, for most people, about 50% of your cookware will work on induction, and then some of your cookware is not going to work. Your cast iron skillet that has been handed down over generations, that will work. The way to test it is take a, a magnet from your refrigerator or somewhere else, put it to the bottom of any pot. If it sticks, it will work. If it doesn't stick, it won't work. Simple as that. Okay? Uh, so, so these are the kinds of uh, things that um, we're, we're working on now to, to basically have conversations and, and even house parties and things with people. Um, you know, to, to, to do cook-offs and things like that so people can understand. Um, this $9.5 billion uh, fund, um, the Gas System Enhancement Program, um, plays out on streets all over our commonwealth, okay? Uh, the, about a third of the leak-prone pipe that I talked about, um, you know, is, is all on the books for the utilities. And so they prioritize streets that they want to replace. That $9.5 billion it, it translates into about $1.9 million per mile of pipe replacement. $1.9 million a mile. So if you have a tenth of a mile of pipe, this is two blocks away. So I live on Charles Street in Newton. Uh, we're not on this GSEP program, but Johnson Place here is. Um, and we know how much from the assessors, we know how much is the downstream stream square footage of houses, how many ho seven houses. Uh, we, we know um, this is how long it is, and we prorate the $1.9 million per mile that the um, rate payers were all paying for uh, to the utilities, and the repaving cost of digging up um, the street and putting a new pipeline down um, to come arrive at a dollar figure. Um, and the economic case is very strong for um, you know, if people wanted to transition to gas or to electricity from gas, the numbers work out really well. But that's a real challenge as well because if you have one defection, you know, you can't, I and mean, we don't want to, we're not going to coerce anyone, um, and we don't think we can. I mean, people have choice, right? So we're using, I'm working with um, a nonprofit in Cambridge called HEAT, the Home Energy Efficiency Team, Audrey Schulman. Uh, mothers Out Front, um, 
an amazing uh, advocacy organization, climate advocacy organization, to, um, to use social marketing across municipalities and find, you know, if there is a block, uh, a, a group of neighbor, neighbors that want to do this, then we want to work with them um, and, and see if we can pilot this and prove the point, prove that it can be done. And it, we think if we find some success, that it could be something that becomes more popular. Um, so I'm going to just wrap up and uh, just recap. Um, I talked about the scope of urban gas leaks, over 3,000 in uh, Boston. It's an East Coast problem, at least. Um, the impact with greenhouse gas emissions, uh, super emitters, and taking the off-ramp to, here's my lane, Electric Avenue. Uh, and with that, uh, there's Margaret, Bob Ackley, really good. He's the person who was doing the sniffing of the gas that I first learned about this. He knows more about gas leaks than anyone I know. Um, and just a, a, a range of collaborators and funding sources. So, thank you. We have time for questions, but I want to make two comments. Uh, one of his graduate students was an undergrad who worked in my lab a few back years ago. So if you are thinking about grad school, you might end up in Nathan's lab. So that was my first comment. The other one is I forgot to thank those of us, those who sponsor this, in addition to environmental studies and all the work that the program puts in. Tisch College provides the room, and I want to thank Tisch for, for their support, and the Tuscan Institute of the Environment provided your food. So with that, we'll open it up for questions. Hi. Hi. I recognize you from 350 Mass. Um, so my question is about the global warming potential. Is there a difference between the GWP for therm thermogenic methane and biogenic methane? No. There is not. Okay. And then I'm just more curious about that, what you said about the steel on, on the roads. I see that all the time around the area. So is that who's not communicating um, when they replace a road? and then have to dig up and triage, I'm guessing. Like, what's that about? Yeah, so typically it's a case where the road paving, unless it's a state road, um, it's going to be a municipal department of public works that's responsible for the planning and the scheduling of you know, which street is going to get repaved first. And then the utility, investor-owned utility, which has a much bigger service area, like National Grid in, in Newton, um, they've got their own plans for, you know, like with the GSEP or a call comes in for someone smelled a leak and they have to, you know, replace or, or fix the leak. Uh, so they have their own priorities and there's just not a, there's not a, um, a tight linkage between those. Um, there start to be conversations, like in Newton, they say we have weekly or monthly conversations, um, but things still fall through the cracks. Because this was the, the example I showed was not that long ago, and you know it was after I had heard that they do have coordination meetings, but these things still do happen. Thank you, Nathan, for a great talk with uh, real life applications. And by seeing your slides, I see that you collaborate with a number of federal agencies, uh, NGOs, uh, universities. Can you talk a little more about? the nature of the collaboration, how it started, how, how it works, and anything that you want to add to that? Yeah, it's been such an interesting um, kind of collection of, you know, people and groups and entities. Um, until about five years ago, I had really nothing to do with utilities. I never really thought about, other than we paid our bills, you know, our electric bills and gas bills. So. Um, you know, uh, working alongside uh, the, the utilities uh, or, um, you know, has been a very interesting uh, um, experience. And then to see our work get published and then for advocacy organizations to pick it up, uh, like Mothers Out Front, 350, uh, Sierra Club, um, and to watch them do what they do best has been really amazing. And I've come to realize that um, the people who are concerned about new 
fossil fuel infrastructure, whether it's the West Roxbury lateral pipeline that went in, the Weymouth compressor station that is being bought right now, the advocates know the law and the policy more than anyone. I, I've been so impressed at the level of understanding. For example, I had no idea about the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. The advocates um, that I work with, I learned um, that it's an agency that is absolutely um, riddled with conflicts of interest that they get away with. I don't know how they get away. Well, I know how they get away with it now in the last year, but I don't know how they, they get away with very, very clear conflicts of interest. So, it, for example, in the Weymouth compressor state, I, I'm actually going on a rant, so I should stop there. But it's, it's, it's been an amazing, um, you know, group of people to, and organizations to collaborate with. You talked about that it was only an East Coast problem that has a lot of these leaks, like older cities. Is that a problem in cities that are even older, like in Europe, or have they updated their infrastructure to prevent these kinds of leaks? The Netherlands was on this issue in the 70s, and they worked very aggressively to fix the issue. So some of the earliest papers that documented the gas leaks damage to trees came out of the Netherlands. And I don't know if it's because they just no soils and, you know, they've dealt with the below ground, you know, flooding and water and, you know, they, they, they just were on this issue early and addressed it very, um, you know, well. Uh, I hear a lot from the UK about problems in the infrastructure. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, I think it would be really interesting to do a gas leaks mapping of, of some of the, uh, the cities in, in, in the UK. Um, so it's going to be variable. Um, yeah. Great talk. Um, Thank you. Can I ask you two questions? Um, one, is there any uh, um, known health um, risks due to all these uh, natural gas leaks? Okay, answer that and then you'll have next. Okay, so um, first of all, I'm not a health expert, um, but I have heard from a lot of health experts that have, have some concerns. So methane is a precursor to ground level ozone. Um, and so when you have photochemistry, uh, you have uh, vehicle exhaust, and you have gas leaks, it's like a perfect storm uh, for the production of ozone, which is bad for all living things. Um, so that's probably, I, at first I didn't know whether it was a problem at the point of the leak or if it's more of a mixed problem. And the atmospheric chemists have uh, suggested to me that it's probably more of a city problem. It's probably not that you have this big plume of ozone right on top of this leak. Um, but it is a, a air quality degrading element. Um, secondly, uh, in the, there was a gina, uh, gigantic pipeline, or it was a leak in California, Southern California, Porter Ranch. You might have heard about it a couple years ago. Aliso Canyon, Porter Ranch. Um, it leaked about 25% of the state of California's methane emissions. Uh, from one leak, and it was wafting over this neighborhood of Porter Ranch, um, and people were getting nosebleeds and headaches, and they were asking what's going on, and what they were told by the California Department of Health was that it was due to the, the odorant that's put into natural gas, a sulfur compound called, a class of compounds called mercaptans. That's what they were told was the thing that was making them sick. Um, it turns out there's also benzene, toluene, and xylene in that gas, and there are no lower limits for the toxicity of those. They're just, you know, no, no, no one has put out, like, you know, you can take this much of it. Um, uh, so what I find very interesting is that we actually went out to Porter Ranch and drove, just like we drove here, and measured the methane values, and we found levels as the wind would blow. It's like a campfire. If the wind's blowing one way, you might not get any smoke at all, but if the wind shifts and you're right in it, you know, you're getting blasted, and that's how it was coming off of this mountain down into this neighborhood. But when it came down, it was like half a mile away. It got diluted to the level of some of the larger leaks that we have in Boston, okay? 40, 50 parts per million, okay, 100 times the background value. You can smell it. I, I walked my uh, son and daughter to school for years through gas leaks that we obviously smell. So if the people in Porter Ranch are being told that they're having health issues, 
because of the gas leaks. It makes me wonder about, you know, the places we walk every day and smell gas. Um, and if people are actually, say, working in a place like, and there's a gas leak right outside on the street, you know, whether that, that could be a health issue. Long-winded answer, I'm sorry. That was very good. Um, second question. So 3,000 gas leaks, $90 million, that's big, big numbers, big money. Um, don't the companies have any incentive to kind of, um, you know, get the leaks under control? Or if, if not, don't the legislators have a kind of an easy way to, you know, sort of use those numbers to craft legislation to correct it quickly? Yes. So the problem is that uh, rate payer, as I mentioned, rate payers pay for the loss in unaccounted for gas. So the utilities, they're businesses. I would not, that, you know, they, they're there to make money. Um, and they have no incentive to fix leaks when they're not paying for the lost product. So there is legislation happening right now, a bill in the state house, um, that w it's called a consumer protection bill. It's authored by Senator Jamie Eldridge and uh, Representative Christine Barber um, that would shift the cost to the utilities. So that, that really needs to happen. We actually need to stop here. Okay. Let's thank Nathan Phillips one more time. Thank you. Thank you.